Some people have a certain power that no one can really explain or define. They just seem to have this ability to get people to trust them and go along with everything they say. It's something that goes way beyond just charisma or charm. It's like they have a superpower that lets them manipulate everyone around them. And today's mad lad had that power. He could also preach the Bible like a preacher, full of ecstasy and fire. But he also was the kind of teacher that women would desire. Rasputin. But before we get into the mad lad, it is in fact your boy Rage Shadow Legends. The hottest game in the Play Store with almost a perfect score and well over 400 champions for you to collect with a challenging story mode. And my favourite thing ever, a PvP arena that lets you slap people around. But right now is the Christmas season where Raid has added in some festive champions as well as hosting a whole bunch of Christmas themed tournaments and events. And right now in the game I'm trying to get 3 stars on everything in the story mode which is a lot harder than it looks so I'm trying my best to upgrade my team as much as possible by grinding the various dungeons and upgrading them in the tavern. And coming soon is their biggest ever update, the Doom Tower, 120 floors of hard levels and harder bosses and even secret challenge rooms. Raid are also releasing 14 new champions. And to help everyone with the Doom Tower, Raid are giving away Christmas gifts one of them being a special champion, Bulwark, who is going to be really useful in progressing through the Doom Tower. So click my link down below to download Raid Shadow Legends, and if you are a new player, you will get 50 gems, an XP booster, some energy refills, and even an Ancient Shard, and the champion, Bulwark. All of these rewards are only available to new players and only for the next 30 days, and you can find these rewards here in your inbox. Rasputin was born around the 20th of January 1869 in a village located within the Tumen province in Russia. We don't know the full details of Rasputin's early life but we can imagine that it must have been pretty tough as he basically lived in the western parts of Siberia which is very well known for its extreme poverty and harsh winters. In Rasputin's own case, out of eight confirmed births, he was the only child his parents had that managed to survive to adulthood. He would remain almost completely illiterate right up until he began to pursue his religious interests. Growing up, however, it was clear that Rasputin was destined for greater things than the simple peasant life. According to some accounts, even when he was just a young child, Rasputin apparently could talk to angels in his dreams. He could also tell the future and he could apparently also heal horses with a single touch. However, far from being considered the second coming of Christ, Rasputin started getting accused of being a demon. As he entered his teenage years, he began to misbehave very badly, engaging in petty theft, getting into fights and living up to the Russian stereotype of being a rowdy drunk. The local peasants got so fed up with us that they didn't even call him by his real name anymore, so instead they referred to him as the licentious one. So in response, Rasputin just accepted that and actually adopted that into his real legal name. His real name was Grigory Yefimovich Novik, but he changed his last name 
to Rasputin, which was apparently supposed to be a play on the Russian word for immoral or deviant. But the real meaning of his name always changed depending on who you asked. Now you would think that this sort of name change would prove to be a terrible PR move for anyone hoping to start their career as a religious figure. You know, it'd be a lot like having someone called Father McKitty Fiddler taking mass, but it turned out that this name change would actually work in Rasputin's favour. But we can get into that in a little bit. Rasputin eventually married a woman from a nearby village at the age of 18 and would eventually have four children with her. However, this didn't quite mellow him out as he continued to get violently drunk. He had taken part in numerous horse thefts and he also cheated on his wife very often. In 1892 though, he suddenly left home to seek out the monks of St Nicholas Monastery in the nearby province. His real reason for doing this is still unknown, though most people believe that he was either facing a midlife crisis or he did it to escape the heat of the law from a previous horse theft. He was also rumoured to have frequently met with an unknown holy man of some kind who would have sparked Rasputin's interest in pursuing a more spiritual lifestyle. In any case, when Rasputin reached the monastery, he began to properly study the tenets of Orthodox Christianity and he finally learned to read and write to a proficient standard. More importantly, it was here that Rasputin met a holy man called Makiri, who was formerly a spiritual advisor to the Tsar himself and he offered to take Rasputin under his wing. As well as taking part in study and worship, Rasputin would embark on long pilgrimages to prominent holy sites within Orthodox culture and he also preached in nearby villages and towns in rural Russia. However, this wasn't just a simple hike around the country. Monks embarking on such pilgrimages would refuse to bathe in groom and they would wear shackles to increase the pain they felt during their long journey. This was believed to purge sin from the soul and it would represent the stage of holiness that one had reached. This is why Rasputin would always appear very rugged in any pictures he appeared in and he would continue to bathe infrequently even at the height of his power. His pilgrimages were said to have taken him through the Balkans and even as far as Jerusalem. It was during these journeys that Rasputin would go on to develop some of his more infamous habits. As he traversed through the Siberian forest so frequently, it was said that he would eventually bump into a heretical sect known as the Kliste who resided there. The Kliste rejected the use of holy books and the religious hierarchy of the church and they would usually meet in their own secluded spots after attending normal services. They believed that the only way to become saved was to purge the sin from their bodies, and their way of achieving this was to take part in rituals, which included getting high on self-asphyxiation, speaking in tongues, and singing and dancing so rapidly that they would knock themselves out. After waking back up, they would then take part in a massive orgy, which was said to release their pent-up desires, with the act of intercourse releasing sin from the body. Intercourse also releases a lot of other things from the body, but let's at least try and get this video monetized. Now, None of that sounds very holy. Not at all. Not, not even a little bit. Flailing around in the forest like a madman and then taking part in an orgy that does not sound very Bible of you. But the excuse that these guys made to have a good time was that if a person had undertaken a massive amount of sin, they would experience a massive spiritual climax from repenting to God afterwards. 
So basically, the bigger the sin, the holier you became after repenting. Oh yeah, right there. I'm about to repent. This could be a possible explanation as to why Rasputin kept his new last name, as it would demonstrate how holy he had become compared to what he was like before he turned to religion. Although it's never been confirmed whether Rasputin ever actually belonged to the Klisti, it's typically agreed that he had adopted many of their beliefs and practices. This could also explain why he never adopted any formal religious title within the Orthodox Church. Rasputin would eventually return home after three years of study, with friends and family commenting on how much he had changed from the experience. He had also amassed a small group of followers around this time, mainly coming from nearby towns and villages. They would even use Rasputin's basement to take part in the holy orgies that Rasputin obviously enjoyed a lot, um, despite Rasputin's wife and kids often being in the house just, just upstairs while the while the holy orgies were going on. Rasputin would even go as far as to give his female followers nicknames such as Hot Stuff, Sexy Girl and Boss Lady. Despite all of this going on, his wife would be absolutely dedicated to him until her death. In fact, when she was referring to Rasputin's manhood, she was reported to have said that there was enough for all. Yes, another one of the things most well known about Rasputin is... How do I, how do I say this without getting demonetised? He also had a Pringles can. Now, these activities uh, weren't received so well by everyone else in the area. A local priest in Rasputin's village had actually caught wind of what he was doing in his basement with the other villagers, and that priest was in the process of launching an inquiry into Rasputin, led by a bishop for the local area. Conveniently enough, this was when Rasputin started receiving visions from the Virgin Mary herself. She apparently told Rasputin that the Tsar and his family needed his help and that he should make his way over to the Russian capital of St. Petersburg as soon as possible. Now to most people, this would have just been an excellent excuse to hightail it and never be heard from again, but Rasputin actually wanted to fulfil this mission. Up until this point, Rasputin had managed to use his connections with his old mentor to demonstrate his healing abilities to lower nobles. This slowly built up his reputation within the St. Petersburg aristocracy. Upon hearing of Rasputin's visions, Macari had written a letter to the head of the St. Petersburg Religious Academy, requesting that Rasputin be welcomed there as a guest. This was accepted, and Rasputin would eventually make his way to St. Petersburg in 1904. But why would any nobleman in one of the biggest empires in the world ever want to meet with some unwashed monk from the middle of nowhere? Well, at this time in history, the occult and mysticism were actually really trendy things among the Russian elite, and they generally held the view that the simple peasant lifestyle actually brought people closer to God. There was also a lot of sexual scandals going on at the time, with many of the women from high society frequently sleeping around with other men. All of this was basically one giant launch pad for Rasputin, to build his reputation and get closer to the Tsar. And this was clearly working, as many female aristocrats found themselves to be drawn towards 
Rasputin's physique and hypnotic stare and probably something else. And they more than likely found themselves having very many private prayer sessions with him. After repeated visits to the city, Rasputin had built many powerful connections by using his natural charm and being able to miraculously cure many nobles through prayer and hypnotism. That and also the fact that their wives could keep a secret. He would eventually meet two members of the royal family called the Black Sisters. The Black Sisters were a pair of Montenegrin princesses who had managed to manipulate their way into marrying prominent members of the Romanov dynasty, making them largely unpopular within the city. They were also insulted regularly for their appearance being called the Crow Sisters. This was because their noses were apparently so large that it made them look like they had beaks. It is also worth bearing in mind that Russia was really anti-Semitic at this time, so that insult might have a lot of extra implications to it. I'm not making any jokes. I didn't say anything. I am just reporting on historical facts, right? I didn't, I did not make any jokes because I don't want to go to prison again. Their status as outcasts and the fact that they were also very heavily into mysticism themselves made them natural allies with Rasputin, who they would begin to visit on a regular basis. By 1905, the Black Sisters had managed to convince the Tsar and the Empress to meet with Rasputin, being thoroughly convinced of his ability to heal through prayer. This was because by sheer coincidence, the Empress's spiritual advisor had very recently died and he told them of a vision he had where he foresaw the coming of another holy man who would immediately take his place. So basically, Rasputin was not only a miracle worker in his own right, but in the Empress's eyes, he was sent to her by God himself. This was just absolute luck. Everything fell perfectly in place for Rasputin to get his foot in the door. Rasputin would finally obtain an audience with the Tsar on the 1st of November, 1905. But before we go on, it's important to know why the Tsar and the Empress were so eager to meet with Rasputin. Tsar Nicholas II was coronated in 1894, and since then he was at constant odds with Russia's feudal parliament called the Duma. This is because he wanted to keep as much power as possible unless he was absolutely forced to give some up by the people. He married a German princess called Alexandra who was apparently described by the last Tsar and even Queen Victoria as being too unstable to succeed as Empress. And much like the Black Sisters, she was also heavily obsessed with the occult, but more specifically, faith healing. This was because her family line had suffered from an inherited disease called haemophilia, where blood clots don't form properly in the body. This meant that if you even get so much as a light scrape, you could lose a lot of blood because no scab would form and you would just keep bleeding. However, this disease seemed to affect only the men of the family. So when their first male heir, Alexei, was born, there was a lot more stress on the family to keep him healthy and keep him away from even the slightest of dangers. So in reality, there was a major dividing line between the royal family and the rest of the aristocracy. This meant that Rasputin would be accepted more readily by the royal family, especially with the Empress's desperation to find anyone that could help her son recover. Their attachment would especially grow in 1908, when Alexei was suffering from an extremely bad bleeding episode. The royals immediately summoned Rasputin, who, upon arriving, threw the doctors out of the room and requested to be alone with the boy. After a few hours of praying and hypnotic therapy, 
Alexei's bleeding completely slowed down to a halt and prevented what could have been a death to an heir of the royal family. At this point, you'll probably all be trying to figure out what the trick was, but no. According to most historical sources, what Rasputin did actually healed the prince, where modern medicine at the time couldn't. So did Rasputin actually have magic healing powers? Well, a lot of medical experts have looked at the details of this case and they advise that the best way to treat a case of extreme bleeding in a haemophiliac is to try and calm them down and reduce movement to stop rapid blood flow. So basically, Rasputin was probably able to calm Alexei down and stop him thrashing about in pain, which would have kept him from dying. But this still doesn't explain why he was able to succeed where the doctors failed. Well, it turns out that Rasputin's own hubris actually played a big part in saving Alexei's life. At the time, the first response that the doctors had was to prescribe Alexei with aspirin, which actually thinned out his blood and prolonged the bleeding. So by kicking out the doctors, Rasputin had, by accident, saved Alexei by preventing the doctors from stressing him out or issuing him with aspirin, which would have actually killed him. Regardless of how he did it, the royal family were completely amazed and eternally grateful to Rasputin for saving their son. Though Rasputin couldn't actually cure Alexei's haemophilia, Rasputin actually improved their son's quality of life and he also prevented him from dying several more times. To show his gratitude, the Tsar granted Rasputin unrestricted access to the royal household and Rasputin would even tend to other members of the royal family such as the Empress herself. Rasputin would visit weekly to treat her for headaches and anxiety attacks caused by stress. Rasputin also became one of the Tsar's own personal advisors and he even prescribed the Tsar cocaine to treat his own various problems. At one point, the Tsar got so hooked to the drugs that Rasputin was giving him that the Tsar would invite Rasputin over just to get a fix. So Rasputin basically became the Russian king's drug dealer. The relationship between the royals and Rasputin eventually got so close that Rasputin started calling the Tsar and his wife Papa and Mama. However, there has been a general trend in Rasputin's life that you no doubt have noticed, and it's that whenever Rasputin gets himself into a good position, he would almost immediately ruin it by giving in to his urges or by alienating a big part of his original support base. From 1911, Rasputin was slowly turning the aristocracy and the general public against him by getting involved in numerous scandals. As well as the usual stuff of drinking too much, fighting and straight up screaming in the street, the biggest scandals that Rasputin got involved in are the ones that he is most well known for. His sex scandals. Rasputin managed to use his reputation as a faith healer to cure the wives of aristocrats and nuns through the use of intercourse. <laughs> his, his preferred methods for doing this were to hold massive orgies in bathhouses and monasteries which would annoy the owners and infuriate the other priests. Another interesting fact is that even though Rasputin was in a literal bathhouse, he would still refuse to actually bathe. So most of the time, he would come out smelling far worse than before he went in. Rasputin would also claim in multiple drunken rants 
that he had sex with the Empress herself. And this has since become a very popular talking point and rumour when it comes to Rasputin. And it was even in the very popular Boney M song, Ra Ra Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen. But there's actually not been any evidence to back that up. Unlike most of the aristocracy, the royal family were known for being ultra-conservative when it came to sex, especially the Empress, who has been described as being extremely prudish. In fact, when the Empress was actually asked by one of her close friends as to whether or not she found Rasputin even remotely attractive, she grimaced and responded by simply saying, Yuck. There are a lot of reasons as to why this rumour has been accepted pretty much as fact in popular culture. Part of it is due to Rasputin's own encouragement, but also in the lead up to the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Bolsheviks actually exploited this rumour for political gain because they were trying to convince the Russian people that the royals were hopelessly corrupt and degenerate. And also, if you are very well known for being an absolute horn dog with all of the other women, then people are going to assume the same thing about the women that you hang out with most. However, this wasn't the only member of the royal family that Rasputin had been accused of messing around with. Rasputin had apparently been kicked out of the royal nursery multiple times by the nanny who had accused Rasputin of acting inappropriately towards the Tsar's own daughters. However, it ended up being the nanny herself that was fired from her job, with the daughters actually calling for it because they said that she was mean. Rasputin was also accused of forcing himself upon a female maid in the royal palace, but she also shared the same fate as the nanny and she was fired for bringing down Rasputin's image and reputation. All of this was pretty much run-of-the-mill stuff when it came to Rasputin, but he did also get himself involved in other shady activities which saw him making huge personal gains. Rasputin would make sure that ministerial and religious appointments were only given to people who were loyal to him, and he would also get rid of ministers who publicly opposed him. Rasputin would also take bribes from various nobles or aristocrats in order to get them an audience with the Tsar. When World War I began, Rasputin even accepted bribes of 2,000 rubles from soldiers who wanted to avoid fighting on the Eastern Front. It's been debated by historians as to how much influence Rasputin actually had over the decisions made by the Tsar and his wife, but given that the Empress always made sure that Rasputin was saved from any scandal and that he was always allowed to return to the capital unharmed, meant that Rasputin definitely held some importance within the royal family. This can even be seen when Rasputin got into a fight with a bishop and a monk when they confronted him over the whole having orgies in churches thing. Instead of this being a clear warning to the Tsar about Rasputin's extreme behaviour, the Tsar instead removed the bishop from his position. Now this was actually illegal for him to do without calling for a trial first, but despite this, the Tsar had both men removed from St. Petersburg and assigned them to minor roles in faraway monasteries. The royals would also enact harsh censorship rules and fines against any newspaper or author who had written any negative material about Rasputin. They would also turn a completely blind eye to any reports about any of Rasputin's misdeeds even from people as prominent as the Russian Prime Minister himself. In one case, the police had arrested Rasputin for disorderly conduct and the commander of the palace guard had simply forwarded this message 
to the Tsar's desk, and the commander, who had absolutely nothing to do with the arrest or the report, was fired simply for passing on a message to the royal family. This was mostly the responsibility of the Empress, as she would be the one to always convince the Tsar to bring Rasputin back on the rare instances that he was actually kicked out of St. Petersburg. She would always claim that any negative reports on Rasputin were the product of jealous aristocrats who wanted rid of him. Of course, the reason why they were so adamant about keeping Rasputin around was because he was the only man able to treat their son. The big problem was that outside of a small circle of people within the royal family, nobody in Russia actually knew about Alexei's medical condition. Nobody knew about his haemophilia or the importance of Rasputin's treatment in keeping him alive. And I believe that the reason that they kept this secret is you can't have an heir to the throne looking weak. So basically, as Rasputin's behaviour got worse and his influence growing despite this, most people believed that Rasputin was using some kind of dark magic to manipulate the royal family. These tensions reached their absolute peak when the Tsar left the capital in 1915 to personally oversee his army's progress on the Eastern Front. This left the Empress completely in charge of domestic affairs and at this point she was believed by most of the aristocracy to simply be a pawn for Rasputin. The aristocracy increasingly began to believe that the only way to save Russia and win the war was to get Rasputin out of the picture forever. There had already been a major attempt on Rasputin's life in 1914 when a follower of one of Rasputin's major religious rivals had attempted to stab him to death. Miraculously, Rasputin managed to survive this attack, though the attack did take a massive toll on his health. It was clear that if an assassination attempt was to be successful, it would need to be well planned and executed by the nobility themselves. The men who finally decided to do this were the Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, the Tsar's first cousin, and Prince Felix Yusupov, who was related to the Tsar by marriage to his niece. Before they could start planning the assassination, the conspirators first needed information about Rasputin's future plans and movements. Yusupov volunteered to make first contact and gain Rasputin's trust under the guise of needing spiritual healing. Yusupov would meet with Rasputin on a near weekly basis, noticing that Rasputin was becoming more and more delusional with each visit. Rasputin would repeatedly brag about how easy it was for him to get the Tsar and his wife to do whatever he wanted, and he revealed that he was trying to convince the Tsar to completely dissolve the Duma, as he believed it to be a threat to his own power. Yusupov's cause for alarm grew even more when he learned that Rasputin was thoroughly against the war with Germany. Rasputin also revealed that he wanted the Duma abolished so that the Tsar could declare a state of emergency, so that the Tsar could then use his executive powers to arrange a peace treaty and end the war. We take it for granted that Russia's entry into World War I became unpopular by 1917, but by 1916 it was actually one of the most publicly popular decisions the Tsar had made. So what Rasputin said was just more evidence to Yusupov that Rasputin was acting against Russia's interests. Importantly for Yusupov and his plans for the assassination, Rasputin identified the members of government who were unconditionally loyal to him. He even offered to make Yusupov a minister himself, which, though he declined, Yusupov took this as a useful indicator to know that he had gained Rasputin's complete trust. 
After reporting back what he had learned to his fellow conspirators, they began the process of amassing support from prominent members of the government and planning out the assassination in detail. They ruled out a public assassination or killing him in his flat as this would open them up to prosecution by the Empress and it may have caused a riot in the city which would go against their intention of bringing stability to the Empire. They agreed that Yusupov would invite Rasputin over to his estate under the pretense of Yusupov's wife requiring his treatment. During his visit, Yusupov would feed Rasputin food laced with cyanide, which would hopefully kill him. It was agreed that some of the conspirators would remain nearby so they could help Yusupov if the plan went south. With the plan agreed, Yusupov arranged for Rasputin to visit his estate on the 29th of December, 1916. Yusupov had also made sure that his wife took a holiday in the Crimea, so that Rasputin definitely wouldn't be getting his hands on her. Before Rasputin's visit, Yusupov decided to convert his cellar into a guest room. This was so the murder would be out of sight from any of his servants, and it would also deprive Rasputin of any escape routes in the event of a struggle. Yusupov also got a doctor to lace some of Rasputin's favourite cakes, wine and tea, with cyanide. He had to do this moments before he arrived, otherwise the poison wouldn't be potent enough to kill him. The rest of the conspirators would be upstairs playing music to give the impression that Yusupov's wife was entertaining guests prior to meeting Rasputin. This was also so Yusupov had some background noise to help calm his nerves. So with everything in place, Yusupov collected Rasputin at around midnight and brought him down into the converted cellar. Rasputin initially refused to eat anything for over an hour, which really got Yusupov sweating. Yusupov was actually so nervous that when Rasputin finally asked for some tea and cakes, Yusupov handed him some biscuits that weren't even poisoned. <laughs> but eventually, Rasputin had actually eaten all of the food, including the poisoned food. However, apart from feeling and looking a bit tired, Rasputin showed absolutely no signs of becoming sick due to the poison. The conspirators were becoming incredibly impatient at this point and began making some noise upstairs. Yusupov excused himself, explaining to Rasputin that his wife's guests were probably leaving and he wanted to take the opportunity to see them off home. When Yusupov got upstairs, he was panicking and he told his co-conspirators about what had happened. Rasputin had actually eaten all of the poisoned food, yet he was absolutely fine. So, Yusupov decided to take a revolver down to the basement and finish the job. When Yusupov returned to the cellar, Rasputin was remarking at the beauty of a decorative crucifix that Yusupov had placed on top of a wine cabinet. Stealing himself for the kill, Yusupov told Rasputin, you'd far better look at the crucifix and say a prayer. Upon seeing Yusupov pointing a gun at him, Rasputin initially hesitated, but finally began to kneel down with his head lowered and his hands raised. Yusupov silently raised his revolver and aimed at the one place he knew would kill Rasputin instantly the heart, and after finally steadying his hand and his nerves, Yusupov let off a single round. Rasputin let out a bellowing cry, and after a moment of writhing around on the floor, he had finally collapsed and ceased to move. Yusupov had finally done it. He had killed Rasputin and saved Russia. After the doctor had checked Rasputin's body and confirmed his death, 
The conspirators had agreed that three of them should drive back over to Rasputin's flat with one of them dressed in some monk's clothing. This was to simulate dropping Rasputin off back at his flat just in case they were followed by the secret police. Yusupov and a fellow conspirator would wait for their return and then they would dump Rasputin's body in a nearby river. Whilst waiting on their return, however, Yusupov had developed a great sense of unease and wanted to check back on Rasputin's body. After descending down the stairs, he found Rasputin on the floor, untouched, since being inspected by the doctor. Suddenly, Rasputin's eyes flicked open and he leapt upon Yusupov, screaming and attempting to strangle him. Yusupov managed to finally shake Rasputin off and rushed upstairs, shouting for help. After returning to the cellar, Yusupov realised that Rasputin had broken through one of the doors leading into the courtyard, so Yusupov's accomplice began to chase Rasputin down and he took out his own revolver and shot Rasputin another four times, this time killing him for good. The other conspirators had finally returned and after loading Rasputin's body into their car, they threw his remains into the Neva River at Petrovsky Island. When news of the assassination went public, Yusupov and his fellow conspirators managed to avoid official prosecution, though the Empress made sure to keep all of them under house arrest, as although she couldn't prove it, she had a feeling that they were behind it. Regardless, the immediate reaction from the aristocracy and the people of Russia alike was a sense of celebration. They genuinely believed that the main influence over the Tsar's poor decision-making was gone and that things would only get better from here. Rasputin's frozen body was eventually recovered from the Neva River and it was buried shortly afterwards. However, the authorities then dug his body back up and cremated it. Some say that they did this out of fear that Rasputin was going to rise from the dead and seek vengeance against them. There are many different stories and theories around Rasputin's death. Some say that he was also mercilessly beaten with chains. Some say that he was given arsenic as well as the cyanide. And some people also say that his body was wrapped in a rug before being thrown into the river. And after his body was recovered, there were claw marks inside the rug showing that he was still alive. Some people have also said that when Rasputin's body was burned, it sat upright in the fire, causing everyone to run away screaming. Now, that is possible as Russia's cold winters slow down the decomposition of bodies, so Rasputin's muscles would have still been intact, and when you burn muscles, they contract, which makes bodies sit upright. But there is nothing to confirm that any of these things actually happened. Although Rasputin was a very hard man to kill, a lot of the stories around his death have been greatly exaggerated. But after all of that, you would think that that would be the end of Rasputin's influence over the royal family. But even after his death, he had one last trick to play. Before he died, he had made the following prophecy to the Tsar and his wife. If one of your relations brings upon my death, then none of your family will remain alive for more than two years. They will all be killed by the Russian people. Tell your relatives that I have already paid for them in my blood. I shall be killed. I am no longer among the living. This was obviously just a scare tactic that Rasputin used at the time to frighten the royal family into protecting him. But his prophecy was still scarily accurate. The Tsar abdicated the throne 
in February of 1917. And then he and his entire family were slaughtered by the Bolsheviks in 1918. Some people would attribute this to Rasputin actually having magic powers, but it can be easily explained if you simply look at what was going on at the time. With Rasputin gone, and Russia's performance in the war getting worse day by day, the people had no other scapegoat to blame this on except the Tsar himself. So, ironically, in getting rid of Rasputin, the aristocrats didn't actually save Russia, but probably accelerated its collapse due to the people completely losing faith in the monarchy. This resulted in the Bolshevik Revolution and the entire royal family being slaughtered by the Bolsheviks and communism taking over Russia. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. I'm not saying that the royal family were great, but they were certainly a lot better than famine or getting thrown into the gulag because you farted after 6pm. In general, many of Rasputin's mystical acts have either been greatly exaggerated or can at least be rationally explained. These exaggerations were widely spread due to the propaganda used by pro-Rasputin supporters, ultra-royalists and communist revolutionaries alike in order to suit their own political goals. However, more important than prophecies or healing powers, there is another legacy of Rasputin's that remains to this day, a great question that has yet to be answered. Was Rasputin's dick put in a pickle jar for a hundred years? Well, if you're boring, you'd probably take the word of most historians saying that this was mostly a myth and simply leave it at that. But this is mad, lads, and we leave no stone unturned, especially when we are talking about the stones of a mad monk. So the legend goes like this. After murdering Rasputin, Yusupov committed a final act of humiliation upon him by chopping Rasputin's dick off. Some people feel that Yusupov did this as a punishment for Rasputin sleeping with everyone's wives and daughters. However, one of Yusupov's servants was secretly a great admirer of Rasputin's and she managed to smuggle the penis out from the estate. The penis would then repeatedly change hands and hopefully they washed their hands afterwards until the penis was rediscovered by Rasputin's own daughter when she was in Paris. That felt very wrong to say. She discovered that her father's now rotting penis was being used in rituals by French occultists who believed that it bestowed female fertility and male vitality. Super male vitality, you know, if, if you believe the rumours. She managed to reclaim her father's penis, but eventually she had to sell her father's penis to some French antique dealers in the 70s because she needed the money. This video took a left turn, didn't it? What a family heirloom that would have made. And to my dearest Abigail, I bequeath unto you my dick. 30 years later, a Russian man bought the now pickled penis for $8,000. He decided that this long and girthy specimen of Russian history needed to be properly preserved. So it now sits somewhere that it rightfully belongs. In full view of the public, in the St. Petersburg Museum of Erotica. It is quite a fun day out, it's just not a family 
day out. Do you know what I mean? And I understand that Pringles can jokes will be made and yes, upon my death, I would like my penis to be pickled in a jar and displayed to the public. Morty, Morty, look Morty, <laughs> I'm pickled dick! <laughs> Why did I? It's Count Thank You on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!